Crimes from the East, your weekly Desi True Crime podcast. And Alex, good to have you back. Hello. Thanks Hello. for having me back. Can't wait. Mm-hmm. This is going to be a long tale, Alex. Okay. So buckle up. I'll get some snacks. <laughs> yeah, get some snacks, get some chai. Can we do an intermission, Bollywood style? Absolutely. We'll go get some popcorn, <laughs> put some garam masala on it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll have some we'll have a desi snack break. Oh my god, that sounds amazing. This is gonna be our first two parter. Woohoo! So today we take a little tuk tuk ride, or maybe a classic tram ride, to travel east yet again to the swanky streets of Kolkata, 1954, and talk about the murder most gruesome by Birin Datta. Back to Bengali land. Why why do I keep landing on these Bengali cases? (laughs) It's your roots. (laughs) They're pulling you back. (laughs) It's our grandmother calling to us. (laughs) I blame my mom. She keeps finding these stories and she hooks me with them. I think my bong DNA is like bubbling up. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like she's the original true crime enthusiast of the family. (laughs) Probably. There is definitely a huge interest in true crime and detective stories and such in Bengal. They have a rich history of Bengali detective literature. Yeah, so the the crimes and the criminals of Bengal seem to be of a different caliber. And so is the investigative processes. Are they more documented? Yes, absolutely. They're more documented. And even the Kolkata police seem to be like right on the edge of the latest investigative techniques and processes. And I think they've in the past compared themselves to Scotland Yard. They seem to know (laughs) their stuff. Nice. But are their hats as cool? I don't know why, but I have this image of Scotland Yard guys having really dumb hats. Dumb hats? Like big Um, bucket hats. I don't know. (laughs) Wait, let me Google this real quick. We have now we have to look at this. I think Kolkata police has a white uniform. I think their uniform is all white. Oh, Indian police uh, typically wear a tan outfit, like a khaki colored outfit. Yeah, mm-hmm. not Kolkata police. That's weird. White seems like a bad color to wear as a police. You know, stomping around on the streets, dealing with murders. You get blood all over it, dirt. Uh, yeah. Their uniform is all white. Okay. Interesting. Did you see this, like, meme video, TikTok, I don't know what it was, of police in India, like, beating people with rubber sticks to, like, go home and be under lockdown? They're, like, (laughs) spanking guys with these rubber, like, very soft-looking sticks. I bet some of the guys are like, yeah, hit me some more. I like that. (laughs) Yikes. (laughs) I've been so bad. (laughs) <laughs> breaking this no, I'll go. <laughs> I found most of the case details in a book called Murder in the City, 12 Incredible Case Files of the Kolkata Police. It's a short compilation by Supratim Sarkar and translated from Bengali by Swati Sen Gupta. I highly recommend this okay. little collection of extraordinary cases. It's been documented by the Kolkata police themselves, so the details in there are legit. Like, you don't have to wonder if this is conjecture or just rumor. You mean we don't get to speculate too much? There's a few places we can put our armchair shrink and armchair detective hats on (laughs) and go crazy. You know, I do love me some wild speculation. (laughs) (laughs) Apparently, listeners hate that, but sorry. Oops, well, too bad. (laughs) So this book is available for purchase on Kindle. It was five bucks or something. Totally worth it. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. This sordid tale starts in the historical Kaligat area of Kolkata on the cool, crisp dawn in January 1954. Kaligat Temple is special and houses the 200-year-old sculpture of the goddess Kali in the form of Dakshina Kalika. Indian temples are an absolute fascination for me, and my dream is to explore and see them all one day. I really want to go to a Kali temple. I bet it's metal AF. 
there must be like an energy there in the air, feminine energy. What I know about Kali is that she likes to hang out in graveyards and drink the blood of her enemies. And, you know, she likes to dance on corpses. So imagining the sacred space dedicated mm-hmm. to her, I there needs to be some some skeletons laying around at least. Maybe a skull chalice. Yeah, Kali is the destroyer of demons and the bringer of justice. Like, she is not afraid to get in there and get the job done. You know, if the other guys are <laughs> afraid, <laughs> she's like, move aside, boys. <laughs> but she also likes I'm here. She likes to, like, get drunk off of the blood of her enemies. And <laughs> I feel like she knows how to have a good time. She, Yeah, she's intense. She isn't playing around. She means business. So watch out. You know, we could we could go on for days. If we <laughs> yeah. <laughs> talk about Indian religion and mythos. Okay. Uh, by the way, this sacred Kali Ghat is how the city got its name. Kali Ghat was also called Kali Kshetra, which was cut down to Kalikata and then Calcutta, and now its current form of Kolkata. All of this is derived from Kali Ghat. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. I never knew that. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Okay, I have uh, more respect for uh, Calcutta now. Kolkata. (laughs) Named after Kali. Hell yeah. Ma Kali. Okay, so in January of 1954, winter had the city in its grip. The sweltering humidity of the hot summer days were long gone. The city of Kolkata seemed to be chilling, seemed Mm -hmm. to be at peace. The streets of Kaligat Refugee Market were just beginning to show some signs of life at dawn. The sanitation workers began to sweep the streets quickly before the hordes of people descended into the markets to shop for the day. One of the workers who was cleaning around the Keortala crematorium noticed three large packages left next to the toilets right outside the crematorium. These packages were wrapped in newspaper and then tied with a string made of coconut coil fibers. Okay. He's curious. He's like, what What are these packages? I mean, their sanitation workers are used to seeing all kinds of crap, right? They're, yeah. they're not easily phased. But even to their eye, this is odd. Like a nicely wrapped <laughs> package left out in the open. You don't see that in Asia. No one leaves things out by mistake. It's like present for me? Oh, most, most certainly not. <laughs> Bad present. Bad present. Mm -mm. He opened one of the packages gingerly and screamed out in terror because he saw human fingers sticking out from the package, surrounded Ah! by dried blood all over the paper inside. Whoa. The Tali Gunch police were summoned ASAP, and they arrived to clear out the crowd of onlookers who were scrutinizing the packages from a safe distance. Let me get my eyes on them fingers. (laughs) The packages contained two human arms from fingers till the elbow joints, but they had all been chopped up into smaller pieces. So they were full arms, but chopped. Wow. Okay. Um, The newspapers used to wrap them were from the popular daily print called Jugantar, and they were dated November 21, 1953. So newspapers from, you know, a couple months ago, the the year before. I didn't know that they upcycled back then, actually. They probably upcycled way more than we do now. What an eco-conscious <laughs> murderer. Right? <laughs> Props. Okay, what were the other two packages? Oh, the other two packages contained parts of the arms. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was just chopped up and packaged in, in those three packages. Okay, so we just have arms. Mm-hmm. No sooner had the hubbub around this gruesome discovery settled down by the afternoon, did a guard in the Kaligat Park noticed something sticking out from under a bush. He noticed four packages wrapped in newspaper and tied with a coconut coil rope under some thick bushes. Oh, shit. The curious and unfortunate guard, unaware of the morning's horrific discovery, tore open one of the packages, discovered two human legs chopped up from sole to knee. Woof. So, Ugh. Oh, man. Okay, well, that answers my question. <laughs> mm, yeah. So now we have arms and legs. It's like... It's like a sick game of hangman. Like jigsaw? Yeah. Uh, Warning, listeners, the brutal 
description of what was found in these packages is coming up. So give it 30 seconds and see you, see you back in the episode when it's all over. So he ran in terror and screamed for attention. In minutes, a crowd gathered and they all opened the four packages to find dismembered and chopped up parts of a woman's torso, her head with all identifiable <gasps> features like the nose, eyes, ears, and hair callously removed. <gasps> oh! The skin had been peeled off from the face. What? Yes, and the eyes had been gouged out. Ooh, okay. So back, these were the contents of the three packages. And in the fourth package was a nearly fully formed fetus. <gasps> yeah, this part just broke me. Just when you thought it was bad, it gets worse. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's just... Holy cow. Broke my heart. So it had not even been born yet. It no. was full on a fetus. Yeah. <sighs> The Taligunj police was called to the scene, accompanied by the officers from Kolkata Police's Lal Bazar Homicide Department. Lal Bazar is Kolkata Police headquarters. So it's their, okay. their center where they have the best officers. Okay. So they have a homicide department and they were called to the scene as well. They searched the park and they recovered a fifth package, which contained what appeared to be thighs and hips of a woman, again, chopped up into little pieces. Oh the God. newspaper used to wrap all of these parts was the same Jugantar, dated January 10th, 25th, 26th of 1954, and also November 21, 1953, which was the same date as the pages recovered from the packages earlier in the morning. That's an interesting clue. Like, you can gather a lot of information, I guess. Yeah, like in the absence of modern techniques like DNA to help link things like this, evidence like this would have been used to connect the two events as being related at that time. Mm -hmm. So this was one of the most shocking and horrific crime scenes that the people and police of Kolkata had encountered in recent times. And it left everyone involved very shook up. And I hope they got some counseling for that. <sighs> Yeah. Yeah. I think that one would stick with you for life, probably. Tough one. So the Kolkata police commissioner recognized that this case needed the specialized attention of the detective squad of Kolkata police. So Kolkata police is also unique in this way. They do have a department called the detective department. And that's not common. In Did the you rest say of detective squad? Detective that sounds squad. so cool. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Okay, so we have a murder department and a de detective squad, and these are like two separate entities who are going to be working together, I assume. It was handed over to the detective department, and uh, Detective Surendranath Ghosh is the one who was heading this case. Okay. So his team put in all efforts to try and find some clues about the killer, but they were coming up empty. I mean, this is 1950s. They don't yeah. have the advanced forensic technologies available at that time. So just think about yeah. it. They find body parts. They have no idea who this could be unless mm -hmm. someone has witnessed the guy doing it or dropping it off. And that didn't mm -hmm. seem to be the case. They questioned everyone in those areas and they had no witnesses to the drop off whatsoever. I can't even imagine how any murders got solved except for by witness. Mm, yeah. I mean, they knew that their first step would have to be identifying the victim of this atrocious crime. Mm -hmm. But everything was in pieces. So a group of doctors painfully pieced together the parts found in the packages to form something close to a human body. Mm -hmm. Right? They did note two unique things, one of which was that the female victim had unusually large flat feet. And what? <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK. And two, Random. there was a long old scar on one of her thighs. Okay, that's a more typical, I mean, define unusually large and flat. I guess it was uh, peculiar enough to notice. Ah, uh, yeah, I guess. You know, I was expecting scars, R on point, birthmarks, mm -hmm. tattoos. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe she had some like Mindy on her or something, but yeah. <laughs> unusually large flat feet. Okay, well. It worked out in the end, so... Thank God she did have unusually large flat feet, I'd say. We'll find out later why. Okay. Okay. So since the facial features had all been disarticulated, the detectives asked a 
famous plastic surgeon, Dr. Murari Mohan, to help out. And he did what he could to try and reconstruct the victim's face. Okay. This was the first time this investigative technique had been attempted in India, by the way. That's pretty cool. A picture of this post-mortem reconstruction was then released in the newspapers seeking more information from the public. I did a perfunctory image search for this, and thankfully there were no results. Mm-hmm. I didn't look any further okay. because <laughs> often these reconstructions look just way too eerie and they take like a sharp turn into uncanny valley. I don't want to see them. Is it bad that that's like a newspaper I do want to read? <laughs> it's bad. I'm sorry. They're trying their best. Yeah. This mm-hmm. goes to show how dedicated totally Kolkata police was to solving this case. It seems like they were good cops. Yeah, they were good cops. They could have easily just sat down and waited for things to show up, but they were being proactive and taking all of these unique and creative steps Mm -hmm. to try and solve this case. Mm -hmm. We're beginning to see why they were compared to Scotland Yard back in the day. Not too shabby. But all of these unique measures taken by the detective department were sadly in vain. Um, Nobody reported any woman missing in Kolkata, matching the description published. I mean, there's got to be a baby daddy somewhere out there, right? Someone would miss a child, you would think, right? Mm -hmm. So after about a month, sometime at the end of February 1954, the head of the detective department who was working on this case, Detective Samrendra Ghosh, he was returning home from work one day. He's had a hard day of work. He's tired. He's weary. And he had a little cough, like he had a common cold. He was feeling a little sick. It was late at night and only a few medical stores seemed to be open at the time. So he told his driver, hey, I see that store. It's open. Let's stop there. I need medicine. So the car stops in front of this place called South Medical Pharmacy. Detective goes. He steps out of the car. He walks into the store and he asks for some cough medicine. The sleepy salesman who didn't seem to be very attentive whatsoever, he kind of Mm -hmm. browses up and he points to the bare shelves and he's like, I'm not sure I have cough medicine, but I can look. The detective's like, what kind of medical store is this? You don't have stuff? What's going on? The salesman's like, well, I can't help it. I'm just I'm just an employee. Mm -hmm. The owner of the store hasn't showed up to restock supplies in a month. So Detective Ghosh is super annoyed. As the car starts up and they start to head towards home, something is nagging him at the back of his mind. He was mm-hmm. subconsciously intrigued by this missing owner of a pharmacy because pharmacies do good business. It's not something you would just ignore. Yeah. So his gut instinct, like mm-hmm. his policeman's hunch, takes over and he asks the driver to turn around and go fetch the home address of that missing pharmacy owner. Okay. These are such on-the-spot, instant decisions he's taking. But he's a cop, and he's a good cop. His his detective uh, dongle was tingling. I don't mm-hmm. know. Detective. Antenna? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Radar? <laughs> his detective radar. His detective <laughs> dongle. What is no, that? No, no. Let's. Yeah. <laughs> let's not malign this amazing detective. Okay. Um, what's that thing called with the two prongs? You know, you detect water with it, and um, what's that called? Rod. It's a Divi- diviner. Some kind of rod. Yeah, divining rod. Divining rod. Well, detective rod is not better. Than <laughs> okay, no, cancel that. <laughs> well, let's just say his his detective radar was sparkling or whatever. Yeah. His driver goes and gets the address from the pharmacy salesman. He looks at the address. It says 55 Turf Road. That was just four miles from the pharmacy. So Detective Ghosh is like, I can't take this. Let's go. Let's go check this out. Maybe this guy's fallen and can't get up. Whatever. We don't know. We we have to go. (laughs) We have to go investigate. So he heads to that address right away. The home at 55 Turf Road was locked. But Detective Ghosh is not giving up. He knocked on the doors of neighbors and he woke them up and he's like, who lives here? What's going on? Why is this door locked? The neighbors tell him that the home belonged to Biren Datta, who had lived here for many years with his six-year-old son, Boton, and wife, Bela Rani, who was about nine months pregnant. Mm. Mm-hmm. They said that about a month ago, Biren had mentioned to them that Belarani's labor had started 
So he took her to the Shishu Mandal Hospital for delivery. And after that, they've just never seen him again. Okay. Detective Ghosh is tuned in because all of this seems very, very significant and mm-hmm. related to the case he was working on. What are the chances that he would go to the pharmacy of a potential victim? Yeah. That's crazy. It is, isn't it? Like, can you just imagine the adrenaline rush that he would probably have been going through? Like, (laughs) he makes a prompt call to the hospital and sure enough, no one by that name had been admitted in that hospital in the last month. So he knew that he was on the trail of an evil killer, a monster who mercilessly killed and mutilated an innocent young woman in the most brutal manner he had ever seen. Mm -hmm. And he was convinced that this monster was none other than the 34-year-old Biren Datta. Her husband. Her husband. Because it's always the husband. Yeah, that's true. It's always the husband. This is such a potential, like, synchronicity situation. Like, uh, high strangeness? (laughs) Yeah, definitely. (laughs) For sure. So the next day, plain clothes policemen were staking out this turf road address. And they also figured out uh, from asking around that Biren Datta had another address connected to his name. And they staked out that home as well. That home was on Harish Mukherjee Road, which was less than a mile from this home. Okay. Under the cover of darkness on February 27, which is, I think, just a day after Detective Ghosh found all of these details. Mm -hmm. A shadowy figure covered in a shawl, shuffled out of the home on 102A Mukherjee Road. As he tried to make it down the street, a plainclothes officer called out his name. Biren Datta? And he replies, yes. Where's your wife? He says, um, she ran away with someone. Why? Why do you ask? And the cop says, we'll do the asking around here. Come with us (laughs) to Lal Bazaar Station right now. And so this monster was caught completely by chance in the uncanny instincts of Detective Ghosh in that moment. What? So he did it. I guess we can assume that he did it. The husband did it. Yeah. It's always. It's always a partner usually, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Abductions and murder by a complete stranger. Pretty rare. Even though ubiquitous in media and movies is Mm -hmm. actually a rare thing. Mm Mm-hmm. Most violent crimes are committed by people or persons known to the victim. Okay. And cops know this. Cops know this. They see this day in and day out. So it was his instinct that really kind of cracked this case. Once in interrogation, he tells his whole life story to the detectives bit by bit. Birain was born in a village near Buj Buj. Buj Buj. (laughs) Buj Buj. Some (laughs) of the names in like Bengal are so... Awesome. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they're amazing. They're awesome. They're so unique. Booch booch. Booch booch. Do you know what the name of the Kolkata airport is? No. It's it's Dum Dum. <gasps> Dum Dum Airport. Yeah. <laughs> I never realized that. I've been. I'm sure I've been to that airport before. Never. I mean, noticed. it's not Dum Dum. It's Dum Dum. Dum Dum. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but Dum Dum Airport. It's way more fun. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Birain was born in a village near Bujbuj. He lost his parents when he was just a year old, and he was raised for a few years by his grandparents. His father had actually been a sub-inspector, of all things. His father was a cop. Wow, so, okay. I mean, obviously the apple has fallen very far very from far. the tree. He had two elder sisters who were married already by the time he was born, and they lived in northern Kolkata. Okay. He also had two older cousins who lived in the south of Kolkata. You know how they see families are. Everyone's so close to each other. Cousins are like siblings. Families are very close-knit and they mm-hmm. keep in touch with each other. And it's it's a close-knit family, like any other they see family. So at the age okay. of nine, his cousin Nabani, or is it Noboni? Ugh, these pronunciations, I'm so terrible at it. N-A-B-A-N-I. Nabani. Don't look at me. <laughs> Alex, where are your Bengali roots? <laughs> they are very, very deep, 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 deep down. <laughs> Almost so deep that they might not exist. Okay. 
At the age of nine, his cousin Nabani took Biren to live with his own family in Kolkata, hoping to improve the boy's life with better education and the experience of living in a city. Okay. However, Biren was a rather ungrateful and spoiled child. He was terrible at school and he was a total troublemaker. So he smoked and drank and indulged in all kinds of unsavory activities for a child his age. Okay. And after a bitter fight with his cousin over this behavior, uh, Birain stomped out of the home at the age of 15. And he went to live with one of his sisters, Abha, in North Kolkata instead of staying with Nabani. Okay. So a bit of a tumultuous childhood, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like he was a brat. So he spent the next decade or so uh, with his sister's family. And over time, he did patch up all of his problems with his cousin Nabani. And they would meet often throughout the years. So on one friendly visit, Nabani was overcome with guilt about having abandoned him when he was 15. And he insisted that Birain come live with him again. Okay. So Birain was like, fine. I mean, I'll move anywhere. <laughs> I'm getting free room and board. Why not? He moves bag and baggage back to settle in with his cousin Nabani all over again. But this time, he wasn't a bratty boy, but a cunning man, uh, all of 24. Okay. Since all of this is narrated by Birain's point of view, I like. I wonder how true it all is. I mean, the mm-hmm. parts about how people are begging him to come stay with him and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Seems rather convenient. Like, if you're such a bratty little snotty kid, mm-hmm. it's probably the other way around he was probably the one begging his cousin to be like please can i come stay with you right exactly birain was surprised to see that nabani's daughter who was a little kid when he left was now a beautiful 17 year old woman her name was kamala birain and kamala were instantly smitten with each other and against all the odds and family opposition to this kind of incestuous relationship (gasps) the two lovers eloped to live by themselves. So they're second cousins or first cousins. This is Nabani's daughter. Yeah, Biren and Nabani are first cousins. Okay, so I think that's second cousin, but it's kind of like niece. Yes, she was his technically Ugh. his niece. So yeah. Yikes. I, like, I know that in a lot of cultures, at some point, second cousin marriage was not that uncommon. So mm. I guess it's like... There's a global history of a little bit of incest, which is yuck. Yeah, so very specific relationships are allowed in the same community or family tree. Okay, well, I shouldn't judge then. Yeah. (laughs) This is one that is not allowed. So they were not okay with this. They did not want... But they were in love. So this was like a love marriage situation. Uh Uh-huh. This was... Additionally. Yeah, this was not traditional at all. They eloped and they just wanted to start a life together by themselves. Since Kamla was still a minor, she was 17, so she was a minor. Mm-hmm. Her father could technically lodge a case of kidnapping against Birain, but okay. he didn't do so because, after all, it was his favorite nephew, Birain. And mm-hmm. of course, the shame of publicizing such a scandalous affair was a mm-hmm. huge factor at the time. And sure. To save face in society, Nabani just accepted defeat and let the two lovers be. Yeah. And it's not like he took her against her own will. Okay, maybe she can't technically give consent, but she was sort of down. I mean, 17 was a pretty ripe old age in Indian society back then. So it's not like she was a (laughs) child, right? (laughs) How many goats was she worth? (laughs) Birin had no goats to give. And so they had to elope, I guess. Damn, what a deal. What a deal. Birain's older sister, Abha, had bought and handed over the South Medical Pharmacy store to Birain as a gift. Man, this guy is catching all the breaks. All the luck, yeah. Like, he must have made some solid deals with the devil, this guy. For real. (laughs) If, If he truly was such a shitty person, why are his family, like, doting on him so much? I don't get it. Well... Maybe he's shitty because his family doted on him too much. He's like one of these kids who just, you know, he's that Bollywood stereotypical like little fat boy who everyone's pinching his cheek and giving him like sweets. Oh, and also he's a man. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. So he's the star child anyways. Yeah. He's the ultimate, like the scion of their family or whatever. (laughs) Kamala had insisted that they get legally married, like registered as a married couple. But Birain, the rebellious idiot, simply put Mm -hmm. some red vermilion or sindoor in Kamala's hair and declared them man and wife. Well, there you go. (laughs) Yeah. Easy peasy. He then changed Kamala's name to Bela Rani. That's a cool name, but how do you just change? Why did he change her name? Just because? No, no it is traditional, like in a lot of Desi communities, uh, that the woman's name is changed after marriage. What? Yes. I don't think it happens anymore, but it used to happen like a couple generations ago. So my paternal grandmother, my daddy, mm-hmm. her name mm-hmm. was changed after marriage. Okay. I think it's because they're kind of giving them a new identity. Like, you forget your old life now. This is your new identity. Your wife. You're going to be a mother. You know, that's part of your life. My theory, my personal take Mm -hmm. on this is that they want to make it very hard for ex-boyfriends to find them. (laughs) That's such an innocent reason, I feel like. (laughs) (laughs) I'm thinking like, oh, they're trying to, you know, destroy the identity of this person it's about control da, da, da. But, i mean like on a cultural level which is a bit problematic but you know i mean we don't know the answers we're just well this is the speculation part sadly i don't have any boyfriends trying to find me so i don't <laughs> have the reason to change my name <laughs> oh it isn't so uncommon that her name was changed like it does happen i mean not anymore but it was very common back okay. in the day okay okay Bela Rani was completely infatuated with this suave young man who had swept her off her feet and whisked her away from a sheltered life. Little did she know that she was soon going to be trapped in a life worse than before. Well, not worse than before, but, you know, her life was fine before, but it's going to get worse. Mm. In a couple years, the magic had worn off. They had a son, Birendranath or Boton, and they moved to the turf road home which was a bigger apartment okay okay sidebar the mm-hmm. kid's name his legal name is Birendranath but mm-hmm. his dark nam or pet name is Boton and I find that Boton. very cute Boton <laughs> <laughs> I Hi, like Boton. it I like it <laughs> yeah again Bengali dark noms or pet names are just so cute and we have some pretty funny Bengali dark noms in our family too we should have given you one, Alex. I, I, you know what? I totally got gypped. Mm. I didn't get the names. I didn't get the languages. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make oh, well, up one for you fine. now. How about you want to be called Momo? No, that's. We that's, already have a Momo and it's a cat. That's my sister's cat. Okay. <laughs> um, let's call you Pumpa. <laughs> Pumpa. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. It sounds a lot like, uh, or what was that thing that you manifest? Tulpa. Kulpa. Tulpa. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Can I be just Tulpa? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Alex. Tulpa. <laughs> tulpa. Okay. If there are any Bengali listeners, please um, help name us me. find. Yeah, name Alex. <laughs> find a doc nom for Alex, please. <laughs> okay. So in keeping with his wayward personality, Birain would drink, he would gamble, he would visit sex workers often. He was fascinated by theater and acting, and he even managed to finagle his way into small parts in six Bengali movies of the time. Whoa. Yeah, so he was a total charmer, you know, a smooth talker. He had a wicked Uh edge. He was a charlatan who held people's attention with ease. And now I'm beginning to see why his family was doting on him. He was probably really good at sweet-talking everyone. Yeah, he was a manipulator. Sounds like a really nice guy. (laughs) Such a star. Like, I want to marry this guy right now. Sign me up. (laughs) Okay. So, (laughs) in 1948, Birin met and fell in love with a woman named Mira. This time... He was forced to legalize the marriage and he soon rented the Harish Mukherjee apartment where they moved in and they had a son a year later in 1953. Wait, did he want to marry this person? Yes. He just... 
I guess he had to. Yeah, yeah. He, it sounds like he might have stolen her flower or something. Mm, so Birain's sisters knew about Mira, by the way. They knew about Mira as the couple had stayed with them for a while after they got married. Now remember, this whole time that he's doing all this, he already has a family staying yeah. at Turf Road. He has Bela Rani and his son Boton, who are totally unaware of any of this happening. And it's all happening so nearby them too, right? Like yep. within a mile? Within a mile. Wow. Like, this guy's got some guts. Mm-hmm. But he probably has no fear. Like, he's a sociopath. Maybe he, he's just so good at manipulating mm-hmm. people and he's not afraid. He's like, I can handle these women. Also, you have to remember, these are, um, from the sounds of it, traditional women who are probably just busy taking care of their homes and their families. They're not stepping out and Mm -hmm. being active members in the social circles outside and stuff. So Okay, yeah. They're probably sheltered from a lot of what's going on outside. Yeah, they're Mm -hmm. kind of isolated. Not to mention, right, he had eloped with Bela Rani. So it's not like she had all these family and friends to lean back on. She Mm -hmm. pretty much had no support system at that time. That's pretty sad. Yeah. He really, like, ruined her life. <laughs> yeah. His sister, uh, Birain's sisters, were totally aware about Mira. And since they had completely rejected the incestuous relationship between B- Birain and Kamala, this new alliance with Mira was fine and dandy by them. They accepted and blessed the marriage between Birain and Mira. But how do they, like... How do they settle in their minds this other family that he has? Is that just, well, we don't have to think about that anymore. I mean, back in the olden days, it wasn't uncommon for guys to have two wives. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It may not have been something that common people were doing, but definitely Mm -hmm. something the more aristocratic... Upper echelons. Yeah, the upper yeah. echelons certainly had one or two wives. So maybe it wasn't that taboo. And Did any of these wives have multiple husbands? I wanted like a chain link of marriage happening. <laughs> Man, wouldn't trees. that be cool? Like if it was a, a woman who had like two husbands. I've never heard yeah. of that. We need to make... Uh, we need okay. to change things. Yeah, I'm going to look for another <laughs> husband. I don't even have one husband really, but let's call him a husband and then I'll go find another one. Okay, Nico? <laughs> oh, God. And then we'll make, give him a Doc Nam too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I suspect, let's put our speculation hats on. I suspect Birain may have only married Mira to appease his family. Okay. Right? Because they had kind of cut them off after this whole mm. marriage with Kamala. Inheritance was and still is a motivating factor in such decisions, especially for a conniving character like Birey. Of course. Well, he had the pharmacy, which was fail safe, it sounds like. So it's not like he was even doing badly financially necessarily, unless he was gambling all of his money away and was okay. Yeah, well, like there you go. Yeah, the pharmacy was a gift from his family, but he and he had nothing if not for them. Like they gave it to him. Right. It doesn't seem like he was one to put in any kind of effort, effort yeah. into making a living. So Birain is now balancing two families. That's two mm-hmm. wives, two small children, and the expenses of running two households on a dwindling income. Okay. Hmm. Mm-hmm. That sounds like some nice pressure to put on a person. Or I mean, he did it to himself. Put on himself, yeah. He somehow successfully managed to keep the two women apart and unsuspecting for two years. He would eat lunch at home with Bela and stay overnight with Mira, explaining his absences to both as just business-related trips. So the catalyst for this murder, however, wasn't love or jealousy or hate. It was just pure, cold, hard cash. Okay. In early 1953, Bela Rani had announced with much joy and cheer that she was now pregnant with their second child. These were words Birain did not want to hear at that time. Mm -hmm. Another child would mean an added expense, which he couldn't bear the burden of. So, naturally, his mind turns to a simple solution. You know, something only a sociopath (laughs) devoid of emotion could decide. He decided that he would kill Bela Rani and simplify his life with just one family to take care of. What about his son, though? 
I mean, it was a son after all, remember. Right. He Valuable. did care. Yeah, he did care about Botan. But is like Mira going to just adopt this boy out of the blue? Like, what was the plan? Exactly that. So he spun a fake story about a friend and his wife dying in an accident and leaving their young child orphaned. And Mira's heart broke. And she couldn't refuse, so she accepted to adopt that child. How old was he? Do we know? Do you know? Uh, Boton, he was six. Yeah. He was six at this time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> did he corroborate the story? <laughs> like, what What did she think when he <laughs> walks in and says, Hey, Baba, what are we doing today, Daddy? That's just a kid. He's, you know, he's just kidding. He's traumatized. He's traumatized. We're his okay. new parents, so he's calling us mom and dad. Did he have a kid with Mira? Yes, they had a little baby. I think it was just a year old at that point. Okay. Yeah. What this does show is a level of premeditation that this murderer went to. Mm -hmm. It's so chilling. Like, he planned this. He planned this. It was no accident. It wasn't something done in the heat of the moment, a crime of passion. Uh Uh-uh. This was a cold, calculated murder. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a good point for us to end this episode. And we'll... Pick back up next week with the rest of the saga. Yeah. I mean, this is bad, but I want to know how he dismembered the body. Because that is a huge undertaking. And it's horrible. And Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. It's crazy. It is tough to read and hear about these details. But it probably was even tougher for poor Belarani to go through it. So. Oh, my God. yeah. Yeah. And she loved him. That was supposed to be the love marriage. And uh, mm. it's just terrible. He was just a freaking lunatic. It sounds like he was actually a, like a narcissistic sociopath. Yeah. Classic yep. type. Classic. Yeah. He knew just how to charm people. That's what they're famous for, right? They're, they've mm-hmm. always been so suave and able to wear this mask of normalcy. Uh, mm-hmm. Like Ted Bundy was. Right. Like, people yeah. couldn't believe it was him. Even <sighs> after his description was put out in public. Mm-hmm. People couldn't reconcile in their heads that Ted Bundy is a killer. So yeah, people like this are just despicable. And it sucks that they're so hard to spot mm-hmm. in a crowd. Yeah. And they're able to pass yeah. off as normal people. You need to come up with a narcissism test. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. That probably already exists somehow. Yeah, but who's going to take it? You think they'll take it? (laughs) Maybe that's the test. Oh, if you take it or not? (laughs) Yeah. Do you want to take this test to see if you're the greatest guy ever? And if you're like, no, I don't need to take that test. I already know. Then you're probably a narcissist. I don't know. Take him away, boys. (laughs) Take him away. (laughs) Um, So should we do Bollywood Corner... Like at the conclusion of the story, I is think there so. Going to be a Bollywood corner. It's it was hard for me to think up movies to suggest, but I do have a couple of recommendations. They're not on this case, but they're you know in the ballpark of things we've talked about. Maybe Bollywood corner could be like Bengali movie corner because mm. that's a whole other industry, right? Absolutely, that could be cool. Yeah. Oh, that's a great idea. So I'll think up some more movies that I can recommend in the at the end of the next episodes. Cool. We can call it a day. So, guys, join us again for the conclusion to this sordid tale. And we'll see you next week for another dose of Desi True Crime with some masala and spice. Namaste. Namaste. Bye-bye.